um, well, if somebody's living alone, let's start there. If someone's living alone, uh, we have a program called Are You Okay? And we've been doing that for years as well. And basically, one of our staff call every morning the entire list of people that are signed up. And the purpose of it, you get the call around the exact same time every morning, and they're going to simply say, Are you okay? And you say, Yeah, fine, great. Sometimes, if there's enough time, we'll, we'll chat a little bit. But, but basically, they're on to the next call to make sure. We've had, I don't, I don't know, how many saves have we had? A whole bunch of saves where people weren't okay and needed help. And we were able to get it to them right away. And we've had some where, um, not a lot, but some where the people had passed and needed to the phone. Um, and the, the advantage to that is that you're not laying there for days. You know, it's, it's you know, from a dignity standpoint, just from the family, it's important for, for us to, to be able to get to them quickly and, and um, make notifications and what have you. But, but the other part of it is a lot of people don't have family members. You might have your kids who don't even live here. They live in other states. And I know most of them, they can't call every single day, but at least they know the sheriff's office is, is checking on you every single day to make sure that you're okay. And if you're not, then you're going to get emergency services response um, very quickly. If you don't answer your phone, uh, usually within five minutes, we'll call you back. Because if you're downstairs or somebody didn't hear it, but we're going to call you back. If you don't answer after that, we have an emergency contact person that you would give us is listed. They will call that person, that might be a neighbor, ask them to go to your home to check on you. Um, if they're not available or they go there and they can't get in, immediately we call, we call the local PD and they respond. Uh, so it's a really phenomenal program. It works with us, it cost you anything, nor should it. And uh, we've, we've had great, great success with it. Um, <coughs> I hesitate to offer this one to, 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 to the male seniors because um, it can be abused. Uh, we have a whistle program. And the whistle program is um, <laughs> it, it actually is a, it, it's a, a whistle with a, with a uh, accordion type bracelet, just a simple thing you put on. If you're out walking, uh, if you're out walking uh, and, and you're in an area where you think someone's following you or threatening you, uh, you immediately just blow that whistle. The thing that criminals don't like, they don't like noise, they don't like light, and they don't like people being around them the way they can be fine. This whistle's huge, because if you're walking along and you're isolated, and you think some guy's following you or looks like he's threatening you, no harm, no foul, blow the whistle. Because that person knows all eyes are on you. Because everybody goes, where's the cop? Right? Everybody goes, where's the cop? And I don't, I don't mean, the criminals know that. We had a saying in uh, New Bedford several years ago, a woman was leaving bingo in the afternoon, walking down the street, a guy was following her. She crossed over because she was nervous, and the guy crossed over. She went another block, he was following her, she blew the whistle and took off running. We don't know what would have happened to him, but it didn't happen, whatever that guy was playing for. And that's the whole point of these programs, to prevent injury or harm to any of our citizens or our seniors. Um, we have the Project Lifesaver program. Uh, if, if you have someone that lives with you uh, that is either suffering from dementia, autism, this includes your kids, autism, uh, Alzheimer's, you can sign up for this program. And we will, we will, we have a person that runs this Project Lifesaver and will deliver, come talk with you, give you the uh, it's, a, it's basically a bracelet. If the person is wearing it, wanders, maybe you want to go take the garbage out of the laundry or something, and the person wandered out of the house, you don't know what direction they went in, you don't know how long they were gone, it could have been two minutes, it could have been ten minutes. The challenge that law enforcement's always had is when they respond there, you go, I'm not sure what direction they went in. Now we've got to call all kinds of resources to come in. And, and guess what are the directions we to spread out and do this big search team. With this program, we don't have to do it. We have law enforcement agencies throughout the county we've given equipment to, and it's, there's a receiver. They can respond, if that person wanders with that bracelet. You call, say, my, my loved one, and walk away and know the direction. Yeah, in fact, we just had one in Norton. Just had, uh, we just had uh, somebody walk away from a home here in Norton. Um, 
they'll respond and will respond. We triangulate as we're coming in, but that those things that we have, those pieces of equipment, are actually picking up the signals to come. And as it gets stronger and stronger, we know the direction. We're generally going to find that person within a half hour. And you can imagine if a senior who's suffering from Alzheimer's dementia wanders at you know 10 degrees. They don't know it's 10 degrees out. They're wandering down the street with the jumps. Time becomes important. It's critical. So this program has been a really phenomenal program to be able to not only locate people, but at the same time, give families comfort. Instead of worrying every single day, what happens if they want? Now, we're in the process of working on a, a program with some people that, that deal with drones, but we're actually going to be able to have uh, drones that will actually be tied into these, these braces. And immediately that drone will start which gives them a, gives a, a much bigger view and makes it even more succinct for us to get them more quickly. So uh, that's, that's an ongoing thing that we're working on. Um, am, I, am I missing something that's on the senior stuff? The idea is safety, senior ideas. Oh, yeah, yeah, safety, senior ideas. Yeah. Uh, if you, if, uh, when you, we'll, we'll produce a safe, an ID for you it will be put into our database. And we generally do that at the senior centers or we'll set something up for any group. Uh, and then we'll log in your information. If by chance you uh, you were confused, got on the bus, went to New York, you wandered around New York, um, New York officer comes up to you, you don't know where, where, you don't know how you got there, you know where you are, you're confused. They're going to be able to immediately go into the computer system and they're going to say, wait, that person's from North Massachusetts. They're going to make the contacts to the emergency contacts to your family, and they're going to get you back right away here instead of wandering around the streets of New York or somewhere else where you're, you're not familiar and you're not sure where you are. These are these are really important programs, and particularly with what's going on today in our world about you know people being victimized. You know, people who've seen it through the walking the street in New York, a um, woman just out of nowhere, a guy comes up. Stabs or steals a purse. I mean, these are these are very challenging times for us. But for us in the sheriff's office, it is so important for us to make sure that we're paying attention to these kinds of evolving situations, making sure that we have every resource available to protect them. You know, when I took over this job, I, you know, I've had critics who have said, you know, what's a, what's a sheriff should you be doing in jail? You just be running the jail. No. There may be sheriffs over the years who just felt that that was their only job, but if you read the powers of the office of sheriff, my obligation and the obligation of every sheriff in this nation is to maximize every potential we have and every resource we have to keep you safe. We were not restricted in any way, uh, except that on, on arrests, we, could only, we cannot arrest for a misdemeanor that doesn't occur in our presence. Other than that, we have full powers of arrest. We have the full powers to, to support our local law enforcement agency. We work great with uh, Norton PD. You got a great chief here. He's, he's amazing. And, um, and and I work. I, I have great partnerships with the uh, chiefs of police throughout this town. And uh, and um, I think most of you know we run the Homeland Security Task Force. We have uh, actually since prior to 9/11, we were the first ones to get a mobile command center. It was supposed to be doing it three days before the planes hit. Um, but I'm all about partnerships. When I took, if we didn't learn anything from 9 11, the one thing we learned was we needed to maximize our ability to share resources with our state, local, and federal partners to minimize your cost, maximize your benefits. That's what we're about. That's what we should be about because we serve. You. And so um, there are an awful lot of uh, programs we're doing. We've got a youth program where we actually, uh, it, it, we actually just got a $760,000 grant where uh, inmates who, are, who are, are, are actually parents who are in our custody, um, they are now going to participate in this program and do uh, parenting with dignity courses. They're going to be uh, working on building uh, new frontiers for themselves. They can get the skills about parenting. And their child, at the same time, on the outside, is involved with our youth program. We just got a $760,000 grant and we six in the nation. And I'm very proud of that because, and I'm proud of my staff because we've got a phenomenal job and we would not have gotten it. In fact, they said to us, after they got the others off the, off the Zoom call, they said, hey, can, can we, um, can we uh, sort of 
model you guys and use you as the example? And that was really a tribute to, to the, the, the kind of staff we have. What, what is our total in the two course? Do you know? Is it eight? Eight staff members? Yeah, eight. We have eight now. We started out with two, we're up to eight. We have every community, almost every community in the, in the, in the, in the county. Uh, we got a backlog of, I think, well over 100 uh, at risk kids that need to be involved in this program. I will tell you just a quick story about uh, one of the first ones, a 13 year old girl, Cutter, who's cutting her wrists all the time. She, uh, she could show no emotion. She wouldn't cry with her mother, wouldn't talk to her mother about what was going on in her life. She was failing miserably in school. And um, we got her enrolled in, in our program. Within six months, that girl stopped cutting. This is going back several years. She stopped cutting. She sit with her mother, crying, talking about all the things that were troubling her in her life. She get straight A's. Straight A's. She's now one of our mentors. And to me, that is really what we ought to be doing. You know, my job is not to punish people. The judges do that. My job is to make sure that when people do come to prison, that they're accountable, to focus on their rehabilitation, adding more tools to their life skill toolbox. So when they leave, they're on a trajectory that will likely succeed and not come back. <laughs> that is a success of any sheriff that's dealing on the incarceration side to make sure that we're doing everything we can. And a number of them will come back. But I tell my staff all the time. <laughs> so let's so look at the toolbox, figure out what tools they did get and which ones they still need, and make sure we have them. And I will tell you, uh, we, we are uh, the lowest cost, most efficiently run sheriff. And I'm not saying it because I'm the sheriff. I'm saying it because of the kind of staff that I have. I'm the only sheriff's officer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I started this 25 years ago. Who has a management accountability program that measures 250 operating indicators every day on every ship. Running it like a business like all of you are used to in the private side. How many meals are served? How many maintenance slips were done this month? How many are seen? And my managers know if there's anomalies, because it's your money, if there are anomalies, and you're running 10% ahead of your projection on overtime. They can see it month to month. They can change it in real time, not wait till the end of the year and go, just give me more money and legislate. No. We're asking, 10% ahead of your projections? Why? Are you aware of it? And what are you doing about it? No. They have to know. And they got to an answer. And if they don't have an answer, we say, okay, let's sit down and let's talk about it. What have you done that caused it? What do you think you need to do to correct it? Because our job also is to groom them and help them grow. And I gotta tell you something. As I said, we've been the lowest cost per inmate in Commonwealth for years. And you know, it, it's all about just looking at government <laughs> as you look at the private sector, the way you manage things in the private sector. And, uh, and I, I've been very fortunate to have Steve and, and, and Jay up there. They, they really work to try to help us. Um, I'm not, you know, as a Republican, the biggest Democrat on the plate in Massachusetts, and I'm not talking about, this isn't about politics, but, but it's a reality of, um, you know, having not having a balance of parties in Massachusetts. So what happens is, um, needless to say, we were always at the bottom. You're the most outspoken, and you're, um, you know, a Republican. You generally not. You know, it could be the other way around. If it was a similar situation in reverse, you, you generally don't get, you know, the knobs, right, or the extra money. I mean, generally, you're going to be down at the bottom. And, uh, but I don't mind. You know what? Our people have, have, have worked through everything. And we've done what we had to do to make sure that we're responsible to you, answering to you. And we, we've uh, done it through the, the Management Accountability Program. Uh, we've done it through our uh, priority management plans, uh, making sure our people are accountable. And, uh, and they all know. They all know. Um, they have budgets. They have to follow. And, uh, and it's, it's worked very, very well for us. Uh, I just want to touch, if I can, because that's a great conversation uh, with a number of you today, about where we are right now. And I know everybody's frustrated. <laughs> no question about it. There's no reason not to be. Uh, COVID situations weighed so heavily on everyone. Every sheriff's office in the Commonwealth and across this nation 
is struggling right now for staff. It's a dangerous situation. Or you make sleep every night. We're having a four star guys two, sometimes three times a week. Double shift. We got families. We have a choice. But it's still a dangerous situation. And we just had a notice come out from the National Sheriff Association saying we have a, we have a critical situation across this nation right now with the largest suppression center of being able to staff our facilities. And, um, and there is no easy answer. We're looking for all kinds of creative recruiting things we can do. I had some staff working with me on, on different uh, new strategies, on those sheriff's strategies. But everybody's struggling. But what I will tell you is, because um, I know a number of people have gone, let me, let me do some work. I mean, what happened? Nobody cares anymore about work. You know, it's kind of like, how do they survive? When people say, how do these people survive? I'm not going to work. You know, you can't get the, they to shut down the airspace over in New York because two days or three days ago, they didn't have the pilots to fly planes. And this every industry is getting hurt. So, I always try to remind everybody, as frustrating as it is for us, and as much as we scratch our heads and we 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 go this way. I'm not going to tell the supervisor, I don't like when you're talking to me, when you're correcting me. Correcting me, when you're very constructive. Um, we were chosen for this time in history. Every one of us. In this room, in this restaurant, and throughout this community, we were chosen. And we have to ask ourselves, what will our kids and our grandkids say to us? When America is spiraling down, as it is right now, as difficult as it is, it's spiraling down in a different way than America was when our parents and our grandparents where we are. And what our kids and our grandkids say to us, well, America is spiraling down. My mother, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, they say, listen, guys, I've worked all my life. Time for me to relax. I, you figure it. But will they say of us that we did what our parents and our grandparents did? World War I, World War II, the Depression. It stood up and reset America. He claimed the rule of law, peace in our communities, to cast on a more secure and more prosperous nation. That's our bottom line question. That is, in my view, that is our charge. And that's why, you know, a lot of people said we might retire. I said no. This is such an important time in our history. It is such an important time for all of us that if you're given the blessing and the privilege to serve here, whether it's here in Massachusetts or some other state or nationally, this is the time to embrace those challenges and pass on a safer, more secure America. And so, I have such a dedicated staff, and they've accomplished so much. And I've been blessed by the people of this town that have this opportunity to serve. There are going to be a lot more services that we're going to be looking at and trying to provide uh, as we go forward. But the most important thing that we have to do right now is come together, not as Democrats, Independents, and Republicans, but as Americans. People that see the, the noise and nonsense is being just that. It is time to bring in our elected officials of our federal, at our federal level, our local level, and state level, have meetings like this, and for you all to say, hey, I'm not telling you what to do, it's just my personal feeling. And it includes me. I want to know what you're doing about this, this, and this. What are you doing about the 300 deaths we're having in this country a day? and fentanyl it's pouring into our, country, into our country, into Bristol County, in every county, every city and town across this nation. In the sex trafficking, the human trafficking that are out of control in Bristol County and all over this country. I don't know if you all know this, some of you met. I was speaking in a, down at the border in Arizona at a, at a rally down there with uh, sheriffs from all over. And, <clears throat> and uh, it was all about this whole issue, how Every state's a work state, every community's a work state. 
And um, I told them, and they were shocked. I said, I'm going to tell you all something I bet most of you out west here don't know. <clears throat> Massachusetts, which is 2,500 miles from where we're standing right now, it's had the highest influx of illegal aliens in any other state in the United States between 2007 and 2017. Look it up in the Pew Research Report. I'll show you right there. That's a fact. I'm not anti immigrant. I'm the son of an immigrant. I'm the son of an immigrant. My father came for me. I do have Irish. Talking about a completely guy. But, uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but we have to think about this, you know? What are we going to do? We can't, we can't, we need know Mrs. Jones' son died a few years ago. We can't have elected officials going, you know what? Doesn't matter. Not my problem. And you know, when Mr. Jones, when his son dies tomorrow, and they'll never be on the birthday or a wedding or anything else, not my problem. And the five that die the next day don't matter either. You know why? Because my politics is more important than you think. And we have to be honest about that. And we have to tell our elected officials, including me and every other sheriff and every, everybody elected in this nation, you work for me. I pay your salary, I pay for the seat you sit in, I pay for the building that you work in. And I want you to tell me you're going to go out there and you're going to work together, not by party, but by purpose. Take care of me and my family. And that's where we are. So it's our time. We are the ones together that will reclaim America, we will reclaim our communities, and we will bring back the values and the virtues of what we know America to have been that we've lost in this country. So um, I, I, I don't want to go on and on because believe me, I could. I have a family of 15 kids. I, my, my brothers and sisters used to say to my brother, we have to cooking out in the grill out there, everybody go in the house to eat, and still out talking to the grill. So um, I don't want to do it to you guys, because I could. But, but I do, I do um, want to open it up to any, any, any questions. There's no question that's inappropriate. Ask me any questions. Yes, sir. And thank you for your service. First of all, I'd like to thank you and your community outreach program. The young lady, I forget her name, Tina. Is, is in the senior center like two or three times a year um, I don't know if they brought the vials of life with them, but if you want one, I know a majority of you are not members of the senior center, but stop in the old senior center, and they have them there. I'm sure they'll give them to you, because she leaves a bunch of stuff all the time. As most of you know, I'm on the building committee. We changed the facade of the, of the um, senior center, I believe, to clapboard and somebody brought up the fact that it has to be painted in 10 years and i'm hoping in 10 years from now we have to come to you to your community outreach program to paint the clapboard on the outside because you did do some painting in our old town hall and uh, i know you have that program that outreach program also so we sort of figured it into the budget and use it as a way of cutting down the cost of oh, right. building. I'm glad you brought that up. Because huh? I'm glad you brought that up because I, I didn't mention that, but that, that's a very important point. Oh, yeah. not, not necessarily just your senior center, but we're doing work all over the county. Um, we, we actually refurbished the historic landmark in New Bedford, uh, the lighthouse, the Butler Flats Lighthouse. Uh, we sent the inmates out on the boat two summers in a row. Um, they didn't mind. Uh, they had a cook at every Friday on, on, the, on the lighthouse, but they refurbished that historic landmark from the inside out, scraping it down. You know, these are things that would cost a ton of money that the community may not have been able to afford. We just built, are any of you familiar with the IDDI school in, uh, in the summer? It's a head trauma, it's a, it's a residential school for serious head trauma cases. My inmates went there, and well, let me back up on the, on the boat flash. When we were doing the, uh, sort of the ribbon cutting with the mayor there after we were finished, we had an inmate left from the project who was there at the press conference down uh, with the mayor. And uh, he had a chance to speak and he said, you know, I am so happy I had the opportunity to do this because I'm my, when I, I get out of prison here, I'm gonna be able to bring my son down here and tell him I restored that historic 
I, I did something important for history. And at the IDBI school, uh, they hired an engineer. They asked us if we would work with them to build a uh, handicapped accessible treehouse. If you ever get a chance, you've got to go see it. It's amazing. You could drive tanks up these ramps. Uh, our inmates built it. Inmates, not only do we want the, the public to benefit at the cost savings and beautifying their communities, put flags on the, on the, on the gravestones during a full Veterans Day and the World Day, which they do, the inmates love doing it. Um, Painting hybrids in communities, doing things that towns haven't been able to get to because of strapped on this and that. But the advantage to the inmate is if one of you walks up and sees them placing a flag on a veteran's grave or, or um, out there cleaning up the street or painting a hydro or whatever, you walk up as a citizen and say to them, hey, thanks so much for what you did. That's, that's the real benefit to the inmate. Because they didn't get out of the school. A lot of them have been sitting on a stoop at three years old in a diaper and a t shirt while their parents are pushing the drugs up and down the street. We know that guy or that child's going to end up in our place. Unless we do something to intercede. That's why we have our youth book. Get them before they walk through the front door. But you doing that makes them associate good feelings with good behavior. And the more repetitive we can do that, for them by having them out there as much as they can be out, they're all volunteers. That's huge. You all are helping them get on a trajectory, a police chief, or a city council walking up and going, hey, that's what you know, I appreciate that. Huge. We were doing the inside of one of the senior, I'm not going to show up right now, but we were in one of the senior places and they were painting the uh, painting the hallways. I think it was in Taunton, I think. And the seniors were making the cookies during the day. And they were like, a lot of these guys never had grandmother and grandfather types. So you can imagine what it did for them, but also for the seniors, right? So it's, it's using this, this office and all the resources we have to build a community, not just community, the outside, the community on the inside, preparing for the outside. I'm sorry, Paul. Well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, could you enlighten us on that uh, SJC ruling that occurred in what was it? Um, we're funding taxpayer. In other words, you can fund. Three phone calls? No. No, it's, um, I can't open this. It said the judicial court ruled a victory for taxpayers who referred to it as, uh, at that time, there was a way of funding beyond budget. Pro in other words, it would allow counties and sheriff's departments to reach out oh. for funding. Yes. The Supreme Court ruled that. I mean, that's a. Yes. So it was a bold step. Yeah, you know um, the cost of because you got so many things to do. We need help. We yeah. do. We do. And um, and so we charge inmates. Um, inmates have to pay a percentage, like you do. There's a profit on any products that you buy. You have to pay extra money for the company that provides the product. So inmates. Are we required? There's a there's a profit margin. Those monies that we make, the commissary monies that we make, go right back to the inmate good. Whatever profit, they don't go, they don't go to me or my staff or anyone. They go to the programs. So they're actually, while well, it's a small difference that compared to what you're paying to run a jail, pay for the clothing, the medical care, all this stuff, and it's heavy medical care, mental health problems, all that stuff is very expensive. We, we, the courts ruled, that yes, they can, we can do that. We also can get profits off the phone calls. Now, keep in mind, those profits don't go to us. They go into to the infrastructure of the phones, updates, new equipment. They have iPads now, that they can use iPads uh, inside. Uh, they can't, if they're gonna buy, buy movies or things, they have to pay for it. But a lot, I started charging them it's five bucks a day. If you weren't indigent, if you're indigent, you got your basic meeting. But if you got money to buy candy, cookies, and upgraded sneakers, right? Why are you saying, oh, Mrs. Jones, I know you're struggling on the outside, single mom trying to, trying to get your kids a decent pair of sneakers. You're gonna have to forego that because they really need it for the prisons, you know. They, 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 have, they got money. Some of these guys have thousands of dollars in their kid eating account. Yet they're, 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 they're saying, oh, no. You know, there's, 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 there's people in government who believe that, no, 
these people are the victims. That person that stole your kid's bike or your grandkid's bike or broke into your home, they're the victims. No, they're not the victims. We can't live in a society that we're, we're, we're moving in right now where we have these people who are very progressive in their, in their ideas saying, you know what? The victims are non-existent, the real victims. The people that victimize them are really the criminals. What message does that send? When you can walk into a wall, not even walk into a Walmart, and then grab a whole basket of stuff that you're stealing and not even run out of it anymore. Just walk out. You're not going to do anything to me. You're not going to do anything to me. We are in trouble when we have that going on in our society. And I am not and will not and have not ever believed that the people who have already been victimized need to be carrying the burden. I've had people tell me, they told me when I was first running, a lot of the problems. Shut down the Ash Street Jail. That's the oldest operating jail in the country. I would invite you all to come anytime you want. I'll take you for a tour. You will be shocked walking in that jail. It's been around since John Quincy Adams was president. When I took over, it was not what it is today. But I'm going to tell you something. You can walk in there and literally eat off the floors in that place. I put in two new emergency agents. They only had two agents when I took over. I put in a sprinkler system. And our accountability program is all about standards. I tell people, when you drive onto our property, you come to the dark complex, you only need to start maybe your first foot down the driveway, and you're going to understand what the standards of our operation are. Because everything, the grounds, everything, are meticulous. It's your garbage around. Everything's from that manager. And when you walk inside the front door of any of those buildings, those standards don't change. So the bottom line is it's a partnership with the communities, yes. networks, and organizations. It's not just government dishing out the Correct. The goods. Correct. Yeah. And so and, and so while the inmates come close, it's you're not they're not paying a ton of money in on, on the profits. It's more than probably you pay outside. But again, if they got thousands of dollars to pay in. If you don't want to buy a product, you don't, you don't have the money to buy a product, okay. You still get your basic needs, you don't have any money, you get your basic needs back. And you get your toiletries and things like that. But most of them have money. And so, so yeah, we're gonna have, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have this free phone calls, right? I mean, I know, I know the governor, you know, said no. But I think it was, it was, it was Vito, right? The, the legislature. Yeah, did Representative Howard. Yeah, you know. No, I know you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. But but here's the point. Here's the here's the point. Make that clear. Yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 yeah, I think everybody probably knew that already. But yeah, it's good point. Yeah. Um, but what I would tell you is, it isn't about not wanting people. That represent Holland and, 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 and the jokester. They 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 they, they aren't anti-family or, or say I don't want these people to have contact with their families. Here's the problem. We're, we're in that legislation. Was there another component that said, oh, and we're going to, by the way, we're going to give $15 million free phone calls to every kid who's made the right choice, who, who can't afford to call their parents once a week, that enrolled in Berkeley or some other college in Colorado or some other place, who made a good choice and they're doing the right things. Those parents are struggling to try to meet the costs of their child going off to school. Is there any allocation for them or any consideration for them? This is the problem. And so the message becomes, you do the right things, you pay the bill. Do the wrong things, we'll cover you. You're all set, don't worry about it. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not, look, kids that don't have chances along the way, it's a legitimate struggle for them, and I get it. It's a disadvantage. And, and so the answer, though, is, not don't worry about it. That's what their people taught them and their families. You don't have any accountability or responsibility. Yes, sir. You know, uh, folks, I think of those black guys that you know, the fire department in this town gives them up. And when you get them, put it on your refrigerator. Yes. Where it's a prominent place to mm -hmm. first responders. Mm -hmm. yes. But speaking of families, you know, these phone calls, these are, this ties in the end into the family. Mm -hmm. I, I, I volunteered up in New Hampshire for the state, and I dealt with it. 
minimum repair, and that transport from the machine. And I worked with them for months on end. And the work that they did, as you said, was fantastic. They appreciated the email, they appreciated the meals that we provided them. And they appreciated us respecting them. Yes. I respected the inmates. Okay, they respected me. They yes. asked me for cigarettes. I said, Oops, sorry, my older sister succumbed by tobacco cancer. I can't afford to fill the bottom up. I never allowed the cigarettes. They respected me. And these people are in prison. A lot of them, you probably in your time, as in New Hampshire, they're in there for drugs and alcohol. Yes. Which is an affliction. Drug related. So I'm like, uh, for three days from now, I'll celebrate my 50th anniversary of not having a drink. God bless you. God bless you. And I understand that every you have AA and NA. It's a fantastic organization. And it took me a long time to cross that threshold to go into AA. But they taught me that that was a unique an alcoholic goes down the same avenue. They may not see it, but they go down. They may not have to go down this side of that avenue. But these people that are incarcerated, they have this affliction. Yes. I mean, I was fortunate that the first thing I went to AA, AA, three speakers kept me told my life started. I accused my sponsor of telling them about me. But no. So really, these people that are in prison in, in, in jail, and I call them counties in jail, not prison. Really. Yes. Well, about 80% of our, our, our clients are there um, with have drug-related issues, but that doesn't mean that that's the reason they're there. They, they're there to support the right. Well, yeah, or they yeah they committed some crime. Yeah, it's, it's, but it, it varies. But 80 about 80% 80 have drug-related issues. Or mental health issues, which is a whole other story about why jail should not be a mental health institution. Thank you. It should not be. Oh, and may I have one of them? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, uh, do you have any uh, uh, work diversion program where the, the kid gets in a and in trouble for the first, maybe the second time? Yeah, I started on that. Shift it through the course where they go to all the <laughs> We we actually my two people that run my true course the, the, the youth program um, that's what they did the problem and I started that in our county with Judge Borders at the time in the juvenile court but what was happening was the court wasn't able to really keep up with you know the, the resources and the ability to be able and they were starting to see it really wasn't effect not that it's not a good program they just didn't have the resources to do it in the way it needed to be done. We, we began the true course program. We still work with the courts. We have the courts refer people if they, if they can, the juvenile courts. Is CASA in this county? I'm sorry? Is CASA Children's Advocate Court? The, the Children's Advocacy yeah. Center? Yeah, yeah, they're here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do a great job. Yeah. We, we just started, but we have, we, um, I, I don't know if you know this, but we acquired the first two, well, the first two in the nation to have uh, COVID dogs, where we've actually gone into the schools and got the COVID dogs, but we also have therapy dogs. And we bring those therapy dogs into the prisons, into the schools, um, that have been hugely helpful because all these kids have challenges. And then the COVID part, teachers too, right? They're all overwhelmed by this stuff. And when these dogs come in, we have, uh, we're doing a search of the classroom, they're also now certified as therapy dogs, and I've now developed a coalition of COVID, uh, excuse me, of therapy dogs uh, in our county and beyond now. I think what are we up to, so 30, 40 on them? Yeah, we're close. 30 or 40 dogs that have been, so if you had a fire here and family got, got uh, lost their home, we'd be responding with fire, police, and fire has them too, we train fire as well. And, um, and we also do training for other canines. But these, we were at one school where they, they just finished doing a, a cafeteria. They, they hit on 10 places in this one cafeteria. They were able to contact the families because they knew what kids were sitting in there before the dogs had come in to tell them, hey, the dog hit on this 
spots in the child was sitting, you might want to pay attention. Um, but when they were coming out of that, there was a kid who was having an anxiety attack in the doorway, starting out a tantrum. And one of my, my COVID officers, the canine, went over and said, I, I, got, I got to see, see this kid, because our COVID dogs are last. But he went over. Within about maybe a minute, half, two minutes, that kid completely changed his demeanor and was fine. And he was fine for the rest of the day. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that you've raised about the challenges for people coming to prison and the AA and the NA challenges that they have. Um, we're all about that. As I said at the beginning, I'm not about, I'm not, I'm, my job's not to punish people. When I took the TVs out of the cells when I first took over the sheriff, people would always tell them he hates inmates. No, I don't. You people who are giving me a hard time are the ones that have been enabling them and encouraged them to stay out of jail. Because if any one of us was in jail, and they told us, knowing the background we have, you can watch TV all day, lift weights, play cards, go to one of the most beautiful gymnasiums. It's not, you know, how do I know I donated the, the, the scoreboards and the bleachers and stuff. But, but, um, or you can go to an NA program, an AA program, a parenting program, get your GED, then you watch TV, play cards, lift weights, and, and, and uh, do whatever we have to do other than that, because nobody ever talks about why that would be good for us and take on that position of responsibility. <coughs> and I said, I'm not going to fail these inmates, and I am not going to fail you, the community. Because if I do that and let them just sit around and say, here are your choices, I'm those people are going to come out as bad or worse than when they came in and never learned one thing. They still have the choice. And guess what? We have one of the highest GED graduation rates in the entire state. Because they were in a place where they were like, they could still play basketball in the yard if they want. But no, you can't go with weights in the gym and no more weights. We're not, we're not going to have that. We have a big screen TV in the unit. They can watch up until 10 o'clock. Um, and you know what? They asked my staff, asked me, hey, the Super Bowl's not over until 11. I said, okay, what time is the, the, time is the uh, limit? Okay, 10 o'clock. Okay, I guess we're not going to see the last part of the Super Bowl. Some people may think, oh, that's cool. No. If they do, then basically they never get the, they really wanted to watch it, then, and they can't, then they realize, hey, this isn't the place I want to be. I lost a choice that I could have had to watch the rest of that game. And I did that at Christmas, Christmas once. I know, you, I, I see you, you have a different point of view on that, obviously. But I'm going to tell you something. My, my inmates will tell you. <coughs> I had a guy tell me when I did this, I took the TVs out, I ran him outside, and he owned a towing company. I know that shot. I mean, last one. And he owned a towing company. He came out and walked, I just went into the breakfast place and walked out, and he goes, hey, sure, I was just in your place. I'm a business guy. This is fair when I first taken over to these changes. He said, you know what? He said, you finally made me realize I don't need to be in jail. He said, because when I was in there, I can took the TV. You're doing the right thing. He said, when I was in there, I honestly was thinking about I was getting close to leaving, and I didn't want to leave. Some of my buddies were here, and it was a pretty good thing. But I've never looked back. So, it, you know, it sounds difficult. Sometimes I'm sad that parents didn't do that for them. But quickly on the other side, you let them watch the finish of game. The next morning, they're going to say, hey, they treated me right. I'm going to treat them right. I'm going to treat society right. That's the way I'm Well, okay. If that, that, and that's a different point of view, I would just tell you that um, from my professional perspective on what I've dealt with in, in my place, um, we always treat them right. Treating them right isn't necessarily giving them what they want to the end. They get privileges that they earn and things that they can do. But, but I think well, you have a case coming up now about contribution to uh, American civil liberties. Uh, I think you had a riot. Yeah, no, we had a disturbance. We had a disturbance. And let me just I'll clarify that for you real quick. About twenty-five thousand dollars in damage. Right. Right. What's done by the prison? Right, right. right. But, but, but let, me, let, me, let, me, let me explain something. Because there's a lot of uh, that, 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 what you're talking about, yeah. was nothing more than a political hit from 
Mara Healy, Washington, D.C., and I'm going to tell you why. Let me, let me explain it, because you need to hear this side of it. You read the papers, and let me tell you the truth. I, I was in it from the beginning to the end of that. I'm the only guy that got hurt. And you know how it started? The detainee incited the rest of the detainee. That same group gave me a standing ovation a month earlier. But here's the thing, what nobody knows, but I'm going to tell you, we haven't released it yet. I've got 205 pages of freedom of information. Where's that case now? Yeah, but let, me, let me make my point. I have 205 pages of freedom of information that a national law firm called me up and said, you're the poster child for, for this country. We want to file on your behalf, and we want to look into this. And let me tell you what they got. I've got the pages. The first page, a month and a half before the incident even happened, a letter from the ACLU to Mar Healy to Washington to my orcas, the Biden administration back and forth. I got 205 pages of it. Yeah. Those were how many years ago? Government of the South. Have you heard of the They still have them. They still have them. They still have them. Okay. It's, it's in well, the that, that's the right. that, 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 politics that, now. And that's what I'm talking about. There's no line of politics in place. I think that's right. That's what Okay. So let me, let me explain to you about the, the change. So, the groups that referred to them as chain gangs were hearkening back to those days. And if we were to buy into the idea that somehow this was bringing back the old chain gangs, where they were beaten and told, well, why do you have to work? Nothing could be further from the truth. And if we followed that line of thinking, then we should shut down all these mills and everything else when they had child labor in there that are now being used to produce good things and, and doing the right things. Those chain gangs, that you refer to a rescue called Tanner Brothers. Those guys all volunteered. And you know what they said? They volunteered for the chain All volunteered. They, this is not, this is not, they weren't forced to do this. They were all volunteers. And what, 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 what this guy did, I'm going to tell you what an inmate said. I was on, on you were Johnny Cochran, the attorney, in the OJ, in the uh, OJ case. Yeah. He called up and said, I'd like you to be on the show, Sheriff, and I want one of your Tanner Work crew guys to be on there. And the American Civil Liberties Union wanted to be, they were against it. I said, well, I can't be in the same room. It has to be, we have to be separated, the inmate, myself, and whoever. And we were. They had us on split screen. First, the American Civil Liberties guy says, you know, you, you mistreat these inmates. You put them out there on chain gangs. You make them work. Yada, yada, yada. And, and all this other stuff. So I said, so Jack Cochran goes, well, Sheriff, I'm not convinced about the program, but I'm willing to listen. I went to answer. You know what that inmate said? He said, excuse me, Mr. Cochran, can I say something? He said, sure. He said, I don't know who this guy is over here saying that the sheriff demeaned me and embarrassed me by, by having me go out and work on this group that I volunteered to go out on. He said, but I like going out doing good things for people. And you know what? The sheriff didn't put me here. I did. I ashamed myself and my family. He said, you know what? I'm going to do after I get done with this show, Mr. Cochran. I'm going back to my cell and I'm studying the pro the, I'm studying for a program I'm involved in here, and tomorrow morning, I'm getting up at 6 o'clock and going to work. What's wrong with that? That was that inmate. And those were those inmates that were out there who felt like they were part. And another guy told, a, 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 he told um, I can't remember who the rep was, stopped by to see him. I met Betty Porter. She said, do you really like me out here? He said, ma'am, to be honest with you, I'm connected to five different guys. You can never really even see the experience unless you, you worked there and you saw them. And, and, the, and he said, I'm in the middle of this group. And I'm learning how to do teamwork. And he says, this is the last point. And he said, I'm, I'm learning how to be a team player. Because I, I didn't know how to be a team player, but I'm learning that. But here's the other part. These aren't, all my workers weren't out on restraints. The reason they were is because I had guys on pre meetings in the last six months of their sentence who didn't wear any restraint. The re and, and they were going out into the community doing painting and all this stuff. We had so many requests in the community, I said to my staff, listen, let's see if we can go to a higher level of security. It's a greater risk that they would walk away if they didn't have a restraint, because they got more than six months, right? And they would be more tempted. And I, have, I have 40 people, 40 people. Okay, let me just And I never had a I never had But here's my problem. I didn't have 40. Okay, but my last point, my point, my only point is, I'm not questioning how many you had, you, I don't know what your classifications were. My classification for the next level was much higher. 
So I was not going to risk a guy walking away that had more than six months. So we said to them, if you want to go out in a higher classification, if you want to go out, you have to wear restraint. Because I can't take a chance that you wander off and, and, and victimize somebody because you're willing to take the chance after having more than six months. Where a guy with six months or less isn't going to take that chance because he's getting ready to get out. That's, that was the whole reason. And I, I respect your different opinion. But yeah. thank you all. Can't have, can't have a debate here. Uh, I hear you. You can have a one-on-one -on -one if you want. But she's got a job to do. We're all retired. We can stay here all day. <laughs> <laughs> we got to respect the fact that he's got to get out Sam, of here. Jim, thank you for the time. I appreciate you. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And I thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.